So I know one of the main challenges in kind of the solar power space is just like that efficiency in terms of absorbing sunlight and converting to energy. So I was just wondering, how do these heliostats in terms of their efficiency compare to current technologies? Yeah, and, and that's an interesting one because there's there's kind of two different answers to that. And as I mentioned before, in, in some cases, we can use our technology to, to generate electricity, right? We collect the heat and then we use that heat to run a heat engine, like a steam turbine or, or some other heat engine to produce electrical power. Uh, in that case, the overall end-to-end -end efficiency that we see is typically a, actually relatively similar to what you get from photovoltaics. Um, so if you think about the amount of surface area we need to cover, the amount of land that we consume, it's similar, you know, within a few percent one way or another of generating the same amount of energy from sunlight using photovoltaics. Where things are very different is if you're using our solar thermal technology directly to provide heat, because in that case, Hello, hello. Welcome back to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm Puneet. I'm here with David. David, how's it going? Anything new? Yeah, no, uh, just pretty much hanging out. Uh, I recently <laughs> took a trip back to Atlanta to visit my girlfriend. Uh, so that was a nice break. Uh, but now I'm back and uh, just work as usual. So nothing too exciting. <laughs> but I see that you're in a different location. Got a different background with some Steelers, Steelers curtains. Um, I'm back home in North Carolina uh, visiting my family. Um, my birthday is coming up, so just wanted to spend some more time with the family. And, you know, I get some flexibility to work remotely from anywhere, which is really nice. Um, and I don't have to take off, take PTO or anything like that to, to go back home. So really enjoy that, that advantage and that flexibility. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it in terms of in terms of what's going on in our lives, and we'll we'll talk about the the episode, right? And as you guys can see by the title, we dove into concentrated solar power um, and kind of how it compares to existing technologies, hydroelectric power, wind energy, et cetera. So I just wanted to see if you had any insights or anything that you found particularly fascinating in the conversation with uh, Steve Shell? Yeah, I think that the technology that they're talking about is pretty fascinating. I actually took an emerging technologies class uh, about five years ago now, I think. Uh, and so in that class, we talked a about this technology, uh, but it was very undeveloped. And so in that case, they were using mirrors to shoot uh, light into a tower and the tower had a salt uh, that would turn into a molten salt and hold energy and then it would cool down overnight and give off uh, basically just energy as it cools down. And so you can think of it as like the latent heat of fusion where you're going from a solid to a liquid and then a liquid back to a solid and that releases the energy and stores the energy. Uh, so I thought that was very fascinating that it seems like back then it seemed like it would only work in very specific conditions but now he's talking about a much more industrialized and robust method and so i thought the technology itself was very interesting as they can not only do what solar panels do with the same amount of efficiency which is just uh, turn solar to uh, electricity through heat uh, but they can also store it in heat and i didn't know this but apparently 20 percent of all electricity used in industry is for just the uh heat um, just producing heat for the factory, which I had no idea was that much. Uh, so I thought that was a fascinating tidbit. And the rest of it is just uh, our guest Steve was very knowledgeable and gave lots of detail about the material science side of things. So I enjoyed that as well. Yeah, he's very passionate about the space and as well as encouraging students to get involved in using their STEM background to pursue a career um, that ultimately helps the environment. So he even offered, you know, if people reach out, you know, as long as it's, he's not bombarded to, to have those kind of conversations about um, potential career paths, et cetera. So he was a really great guy. Um, I particularly found the conversation about the different material systems within their technology, right? Like the coatings to make their technology more corrosion resistant. They have to withstand the weather for 30 years and have like zero maintenance during that time. So there's a lot of refinements that go into that that design process. And then talking about high temperature materials, like 
I believe, inconel silicon carbide um, to kind of like absorb that sunlight. So just really, really fascinating stuff. And then towards the end of the conversation, um, he goes into advice that he has for the next generation of, of uh, students, material scientists that will be making an impact in the renewal, renewable space. So make sure to stick around for that. Um, and before we get into the episode, we would really appreciate it if you leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform that that goes a long way for us. And then if you want to join our It's a Material Worlds community, there will be a link in the description to join our Discord. It's totally free and you can surround yourself with your peers, material scientists and engineers and, and really just talk about all things material science. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Hello, everyone. In today's episode, we're excited to bring you a fascinating conversation with Steve Shell, an accomplished scientist and engineer who is currently chief scientist at Heliogen, a California-based clean energy company. He has extensive experience in developing cutting-edge technologies and previously served as the chief technology officer, chief engineer, and VP of engineering at Heliogen. Before joining Heliogen, he held senior engineering and leadership roles at various companies, including co-founder and CEO at New Matter and VP at eSolar. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Caltech and is regarded as one of the most innovative and influential thinkers in the field of renewable energy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Steve. Uh, thank you. It's really great to be here. We're excited too for this conversation. Um, so a big part of Heliogen's innovation lies in concentrated solar power. So I'm not super familiar with what that means exactly. So can you describe what this technology is? And since it's an MSE podcast, kind of what material differences there are between this technology and what we see traditionally today? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, concentrating solar power is a pretty interesting technology that's a little bit different than the solar power that most people are familiar with, which is photovoltaics. Um, so in concentrating solar power, or CSP, what we're doing is we actually use optical systems to concentrate large amounts of sunlight. Uh, and that concentrated sunlight is then used directly to create thermal energy, not necessarily electricity. Uh, and this allows us to do things a little bit differently. Uh, one of the major benefits is that we can store the energy thermally, uh, which tends to be a lower cost means of thermal of, of energy storage compared to storing electricity in, in a battery. But it also allows us to to provide energy to different types of applications, not just electricity generation, but also thermal processes. So when you think about the the kind of key components in a system like this and some of the materials uh, that are involved and some of the challenges we have, the the two kind of major subsystems uh, that we think about a lot are first the solar concentrator itself. So in the case of heliogen, we use what are called heliostats. These are mirrors that track the sun uh, in you know two axes of motion. And by tracking the sun's trajectory, they keep their, their beam of reflected sunlight going to the, a constant location throughout the day. So the, the types of materials used in these solar concentrators are, are mirrors. And I, I like to say that it's imagine the mirror in your bathroom, except better in every possible way. Um, so the glass is high transmissivity glass. Um, we want it to be optically clear, not, not absorbing any of the sun's light. Uh, the reflective service is silver, uh, whereas low cost kind of architectural mirrors are often aluminum because it's a, it's a lower cost, but not as reflective material. Uh, and then the coatings on the back of that mirror need to protect that silver from corrosion. You know, silver really likes to turn dark and non-reflective uh, once it's exposed to, to air or water. So the coatings on the back of that mirror are really, really critical materials as well. Uh, and then when you think about the receiver, so the device that sits at the top of a tower that's absorbing all this highly concentrated sunlight, uh, there tends to be a completely different set of materials challenges there. Um, they tend to be high thermal power devices, high temperature devices. So these can involve uh, high temperature metallic alloys like inconels or, or, or nickel alloys. Or in some cases with really high temperatures, they even end up being made of ceramics like silicon carbide. Um, so we've got a lot of challenges to make these devices withstand the, the sort of thermal cycling they go through on a day-to-day -day basis and also, you know, perform as well as possible, meaning we want them to absorb sunlight. So they want to be optically very dark in the solar spectrum. But in some cases, we want to try to minimize the black body radiation. So we want to try to have a low emissivity in the infrared. And so we can apply selective surface coatings and things like that to, to try to optimize the performance. So, you know, if you look at either of those two subsystems, the solar collector and, and the solar receiver, totally different types of materials challenges, um, but plenty in, in both cases. 
Could you give an example of like how much energy could actually be produced from a, a system that you just described? Sure. You know, it really depends entirely on how much sunlight you're collecting. So if you think about, you know, the, the starting point is gathering that sunlight and collecting it. So the more of these heliostats we install in a, in a large array, the more sunlight we're collecting and the more power we can deliver to, to the end customer or the end process. A typical installation could be anywhere from, you know, on the small side, maybe 10 megawatts of thermal energy delivery of, of optical power at the top of the tower. A large system could be several hundred megawatts uh, of thermal power. So it, it really depends on, you know, are we generating electricity? Are we providing steam to an industrial process, some other form of high temperature heat? Um, and, you know, what are we doing with the energy? And, and we size it all accordingly. So clearly a big part of the technology that you just described is the heliostats. Uh, and as you mentioned, there's two degrees of freedom of movement. Uh, this is kind of like solar panels as well. But from what we've seen in that uh, realm of renewable energy is it increases the cost and complexity as well as maintenance. Could you discuss the challenges and uh, in operating and maintaining these heliostat arrays on such a large scale? A absolutely. And, uh, you know, a, a joke I often make is that engineering would be easy if there was no such thing as a cost target. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, designing heliostats, it, it sounds straightforward, right? You take a mirror, you put it on a motion system to make it make it track the sun. Um, you know, how hard can that be? The The reality is that is that achieving this at a cost competitive price is really where a lot of the challenges are. Um, so, as I mentioned, if we want to make a meaningful impact we need to collect a lot of energy, which means collecting a lot of sunlight. Um, so for a sense of scale, these heliostats at, at Heliogen, our heliostats are around two square meters in size. So roughly the size of a photovoltaic panel. Mm -hmm. And a typical project we would install could have anywhere from 10,000 of those heliostats on kind of a small project up to maybe a million heliostats on a big project. Okay, so we're talking about a large array, you know, covering, you know, hundreds or even thousands of acres of, of land. So to be economically competitive with fossil fuels, which is, of course, our goal, you know, we want our customers to do this because it saves them money, not just because they they want to reduce their carbon emissions. And obviously, we accomplish both. But to, to get to that economically competitive point, these heliostats need to be very low cost initially. We need to manufacture them at a very low price. We need to be able to install them very quickly um, with very little labor in the field. And they have to operate for a period of 20 to 30 years with zero maintenance. <laughs> okay, so like literally zero kind of maintenance. You can't be doing oil changes or replacing parts every couple of years because there's just too many of them in the field to be able to afford that kind of maintenance. So what we spend a lot of our time designing the heliostats for and testing them against are, are temperature extremes, uh, high wind events, uh, intense sunlight and the, the ultraviolet radiation from the sun that tends to degrade materials dust storms, you know, precipitation, rain, snow, hail. You can imagine a glass mirror and hail balls don't always get along very well. So we, you know, we launch ice balls at the heliostat from a cannon to test them. And, you know, we, we go through all of that to try to ensure that once we put that heliostat out in the field, it's going to be operating, you know, reliably for for decades. And, and while it's subjected to sort of all of that, all of that uh, traumatic experience from these harsh environments, the whole time it needs to be maintaining a positioning accuracy of about a 20th of a degree to get the performance we want out of the optical system. So, you know, it's it's a challenging thing to do with a very low cost system. And and really what it involves is, you know, a, a pretty substantial team of, of engineers and scientists here at Heliogen that iterate on our design. We, we, we tend to go through a very iterative kind of prototype test, refine design, prototype test, refine design process to kind of squeeze out as much material as we can uh, you know, how thick do we need that corrosion protective coating to be? How thick does that cable or that piece of steel need to be to withstand the wind loads? You know, how can we kind of minimize all the material that we use throughout this system without overdoing it and, and starting to see failures from some of these conditions that we experience? So, uh, yeah, quite a challenging design uh, challenge when you think about the combination of the, the price target that we need to hit with the very long life and high reliability that's required. So... I know one of the main challenges in kind of the solar power space is just like that efficiency in terms of absorbing sunlight and converting to energy. So I was just wondering, how do these heliostats in terms of their efficiency compare to current technologies? Yeah, and, and that's an interesting one because there's there's kind of two different answers to that. And as I mentioned before, in, in some cases, we can use our technology to to generate electricity, right? We collect the heat and then we use that heat to run 
a heat engine, like a steam turbine or, or some other heat engine to produce electrical power. Uh, in that case, the overall end-to-end -end efficiency that we see is typically actually relatively similar to what you get from photovoltaics. Um, so if you think about the amount of surface area we need to cover, the amount of land that we consume, it's similar, you know, within a few percent one way or another of generating the same amount of energy from sunlight using photovoltaics. Where things are very different is if you're using our solar thermal technology directly to provide heat, because in that case, we're not converting that heat to electricity. And that's actually one of the least efficient. It's by far the least efficient part of the whole process of generating electricity. So if we can avoid that step and actually deliver thermal energy to an industrial customer, we tend to be about, say, two and a half times more efficient than using electricity or, or using photovoltaics to produce electricity and then electric heaters for that that thermal process. So in that case, we we can downsize our system significantly. We we use about you know sixty percent less land um, than would be required to do the same thing using photovoltaic and, and electric heating. You mentioned industrial customers, so I just wanted to see kind of who are your current clients, right, and what that could look like in the future. You know, because I just bought a house last year, and and my heat bill, especially in Minnesota, was was high in uh, in the winter. So I'm just wondering, you know, is there plans in the future to to move to residential customers in addition to maybe like the commercial commercial widespread scale industrial scale? So for for concentrating solar technologies, they they tend to be cost effective at medium to large scale. So a, a system like this is probably not going to make its way into a residential application anytime too soon. Um, when we're generating temperatures at the top of the tower, anywhere from 500 to 1000 degrees C, that tends to be something that, you know, a, a residence doesn't want to tolerate. <laughs> um, yeah. And and just the, the economies of scale, the, these systems tend to want to be large. So typical customers that we work with range you know they're 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 industrial and up so uh, the the list of clients you know if you think about what are energy consumers of substantial size who tend to be located in areas where there's a good solar resource so it's a desert like environment a, a good sunny place and they tend to be remote enough that we've got enough land available to install the facility adjacent it tends to be things like mining and mineral processing um, some oil and gas, sometimes, um, you know, heavy duty sort of industrial cement factories, cement production facilities, um, this sort of thing. So um, some of the clients that we work with, well, I, I can name at least one by name. Um, Woodside Energy is the, the largest natural gas producer in Australia. Um, and they're they are very aggressively looking to shift away from natural gas and get into clean technologies um, that rely on a lot of their expertise, but but not resource extraction exclusively. So things like producing green hydrogen and exporting hydrogen rather than uh, natural gas and, and that sort of thing. So we're, we're working closely with them on a, on a pilot project. Um, and then we've got a sort of long list of uh, confidential mining industry customers that we work with pretty closely as well. Um, look forward to being able to announce some of those by name in the near future. So I imagine another big challenge for concentrated solar power is the weather. So as clouds are blocking, it's raining, et cetera, it provides some unpredictability and instability. So my first question for you is, in terms of reliability and year-long efficiency, how does it compare to other renewable energy like wind or hydro? electric. And then my second question is, for a lot of these other uh, types of technologies, you can do peak shaving with batteries as it produces energy. But for your thermal application, is there any smart way that we can store that energy for later use? Yeah, this is a this is a great topic. And as as renewable energy sources start to become more and more dominant in our energy mix, this issue of intermittency has become more and more important. So um, because really every renewable energy source that we have is subject to some amount of intermittency. It's dependent on the environment in some way, and we we obviously don't have complete control over that. So in the energy industry, a, a common term that's used is called the capacity factor. And what this is essentially the ratio between the amount of energy generated by the facility in a given amount of time divided by the amount of energy it would have produced if it was operating at full load through that entire period. Um, so we tend to look at this on an annual basis because there's seasonal effects with with solar, of course. So if you think about you know how many megawatt hours we deliver versus how many megawatt hours we would have in eight thousand seven hundred and sixty hours, right, a full year of of full production, and expressing that as a percentage is a good metric to to get an idea of this. Um, so if you look at the averages for different sources within the United States, 
geothermal is is pretty good. It tends to be around the mid seventies, right? So it's a relatively high capacity factor. Hydroelectric is wildly variable. Um, it can be as high as the high nineties. You know, in some cases, the hydro plants just run all the time. But the the nationwide average is actually in the low forties. Um, there's a lot of hydro that is just very intermittent because of the the lack of water flowing through the dams. Wind power tends to be in the mid thirties, so mid thirty percentages. Um, solar photovoltaic averages around the mid twenties. Concentrating solar power without thermal energy storage, so the the CSP from we'll say fifteen years ago, kind of traditional CSP systems. Uh, are also in the mid 20s so very similar to solar photovoltaic because it's using the same sunlight as as the input energy and that's where things get interesting with csp and thermal storage because we can cost effectively add that thermal battery to our system so we're collecting sunlight collecting that thermal energy during the daytime when the sun's shining and because thermal energy storage is less costly per unit energy than a battery we can afford to put a bigger thermal battery than what we could afford to do an electrical battery. So instead of being limited to say three or four hours of battery storage, which is kind of typical for, for solar PV plants now, we tend to put anywhere from 16 to 20 hours of thermal storage on our designs. And with a large kind of longer duration thermal storage system like that, we can see capacity factors as high as 80%. Uh, depends a lot on the location, you know, talking about like ideal, you know, Southern California or Arizona sunshine versus you mentioned Minnesota, it's not going to perform nearly as well up there, <laughs> high latitude, you know, a lot of clouds, but typically in, in favorable locations, we see, you know, capacity factors around 70 to 80% um, for the designs that we include this, this large thermal energy storage system. So that really is, is I think about the kind of overall mix of, you know, renewable energy technologies and sources that we can apply to kind of this massive problem that we have, the ability to cost effectively include that longer duration thermal energy storage is is really the one of the biggest advantages of of concentrating solar technology. Could you maybe explain uh, what type of thermal batteries you are using? Uh, I'm not sure that a lot of us would be very familiar with thermal batteries. No problem. So it, it's uh, once I explain it, it's going to seem very, very simple. So uh, imagine having a very large mass of some kind of solid material and what that material is depends a little bit on the application the temperature range that we're that we're targeting and that sort of thing but it could it, it could be anything from from literally a, a mined material like a basalt a rock or a more highly engineered ceramic material we, we use bauxite centered bauxite for some of the projects that we have coming up um, or for very high temperature applications even you know more engineered ceramics like alumina but just imagine you've got a essentially a silo, like picture a grain silo, but but made of high temperature and, and insulated materials. And you just fill that silo with extremely hot, solid media. So throughout the day, we're we're heating that material and depositing it into the silo. And maybe there's uh, just for a sense of scale, there may be a couple thousand tons of, of this stuff that we heat up through over the course of the day. And then when we want to deliver the energy, we let that material flow through a heat exchanger. So we actually, like like sand through an hourglass, we let that material flow through a heat exchanger to extract the energy back out of it when we need it. And as the material flows through, it's it's heating another fluid that does the work, and the material mm -hmm. itself is cooling down. So then we store it in a in a lower temperature silo. And then the next day, when the sun comes back up, we we take the cold material back up the tower, heat it up, and deposit it in the hot silo again. So very much like like an hourglass, but the, the top half of the hourglass is at, say, seven or 800 degrees centigrade, and the bottom half of the hourglass is, you know, several hundred degrees cooler than that. So we we call it the cold silo, but it may still be 300 degrees or 400 degrees, so it's not necessarily <laughs> that cold. Uh, but, but yeah, essentially, it's uh, take a very large mass of, of this, you know, some material and make it really, really hot and just use the the heat capacity of that material as as your energy storage. And fundamentally, that's why it's such a cost-effective thing to do because we're relying on just the bulk heat capacity of this material. And so we can use very low cost materials to do that job. We don't need things like lithium and, and cobalt and nickel that you see in lithium ion batteries. And you know, I'm sure everybody's aware that the price of those commodities have started to skyrocket lately. So it's becoming very challenging to make batteries cost-effectively. Whereas, you know, if we're mining rock out of the ground, um, you know, sand, you know, relatively low cost materials, kind of these just bulk quantities, we're, we're kind of attacking the problem with, um, you know, very large quantities of low cost material rather than, you know, smaller quantities of extremely expensive and highly engineered materials. 
So I want to kind of dive into some of these material systems without getting into proprietary information, sure. right? Um, but I just was curious, you talked about the coatings, right? And, you know, making it corrosion and resistant. And that's certainly like super important to make it for its longevity, right? So I was just wondering, do you ever have these uh, kind of battles between material systems within the same technology? Like, for example, with the coatings, does that hurt like its efficiency because it's a different material? I'm just wondering if there's kind of like a, a back and forth or a trade-off that you have to make um, with the thickness of these coating layers. There, there certainly can be some significant trades. Um, so one one common area that that we deal with this is in the heliostat, a lot of the structural components are are made of steel. And obviously steel unprotected is going to corrode over time. And so we need to make sure that we're providing a corrosion protection coating on, on that steel. But the question is, how do we do that with sufficient longevity and cost effectively where the cost is not only the cost of the coating itself, but also the implications on the manufacturing process. Um, so for example, one of the one of the most reliable corrosion protection coatings is what's called hot dip galvanization, right? You you literally dip the steel part in a in a vat of molten zinc, and you end up with this nice thick zinc coating on it that becomes kind of a sacrificial layer. One of the challenges with that is once you've done that, you can't weld to that part anymore without destroying the zinc coating and removing it. And you know, there's some fumes that come off, and there's all kinds of complications associated with that in the manufacturing process. So now the question is, okay, well, do we weld everything first and then dip it? Or do we use some other coatings or different joining processes, different welding processes that can join these parts without damaging that, that zinc coating, right? So that's that's sort of one small example, but it's the, the sort of very detailed, nuanced trade studies that we have to go through in order to be able to, again, ensure that we have got the really long life on these components and we can manufacture millions of them in a way that's highly automated and and low cost and repeatable. Um, so that's one that comes right off the top of my mind. The, the other that's, you know, we occasionally deal with is dissimilar materials, right? Um, galvanic corrosion is, is a thing. So you take a, a stainless steel part and aluminum part and you bolt them together. Well, the fact that those two materials are different from one another, they want to create a small voltage potential. And now you actually get a little bit of uh, electrical current flowing through that joint and over time they'll corrode each other. So, you know, how do you then put an interface between those two parts or do you, can you change the material or put some other coating on them in order to prevent the electrical contact and the galvanic corrosion that can happen? Um, so anytime we have two different materials that are being joined together in some way, um, we have to be very, very careful and look closely at what those materials are and whether we're creating that, that kind of risk. The, the other one that's, that's really critical, um, you know, I mentioned the mirror. Obviously, it's uh, you know, it's a it's a very important component. If the mirror starts corroding, it's not going to reflect sunlight. And you know, we work closely with several mirror manufacturers to understand what is their sort of the sandwich or the stack of layers that they use, and they're they're fairly highly uh, engineered products. So you've got the base layer is is glass, as I mentioned. They put down an extremely thin layer of of silver, but then you know, what materials do they put behind that silver in what order and exactly what kind of secret sauce formulations in order to sufficiently protect that silver and ensure that there's not going to be any little, any little pinhole in that coating that allows, you know, oxygen or water to start to get, get down to it. Um, so, you know, each, each supplier has their own kind of, you know, secret sauce on that. Um, but it's extremely important because it's just so easy to get it wrong. Um, and it's it's a very expensive sort of catastrophic thing if it does go wrong. So you can imagine a, a million square meters of mirrors that need to be replaced after five years instead of 30. Uh, that can be quite costly. So we're, we're really, really careful about that. And, and uh, like I said, I can't can't talk too much about exactly what the what the kind of chemistry involved is on that because it's, it's sure. proprietary with our suppliers, but um, super critical area that, that we have to keep a close eye on. So, OK, so I was also curious about kind of that you mentioned the high temperature materials and uh, like absorbing sunlight, right? So I believe you mentioned materials like inconel or like silicon carbide, like high temperature ceramics or or alloys. What kind of properties are you are you looking for when making when selecting those materials? Sure, yeah, we 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 look for unobtainium. <laughs> you know, if you <laughs> if you list out all the properties we would want, um, there no material exists, and so it, it's always a trade off of you know, what are we willing to design around or sacrifice? But, 
typically the things that are important, um, obviously it needs to, to maintain its mechanical properties at high temperature. If you look at, particularly with metallic alloys, the, the strength of that material, you know, the yield strength, basically how much, how much stress can we put it under before it starts to deform permanently, that value decreases at higher temperatures. And so kind of exactly what is that curve of strength versus temperature look like and how hot can we get this stuff before it starts to fail? Um, that's one of the first things that we need to look at. Um, secondly, again, particularly with metallic alloys, are the fatigue properties. Um, so every time we heat this system up, the the fact that it's it's changing in temperature and there are thermal expansion, right? The hotter something is, the the more that it wants to grow. We can create large thermal stresses in these systems by having non-uniform heating. So you can imagine if we're if we've got a pipe, you know, some metallic tube, and we're putting a bunch of concentrated sunlight on on one side of that tube, the other side is is not illuminated. You get a, a, a high temperature on one side, a low temperature on the other, and it creates all these kind of thermal stresses because the front of it is trying to expand. The back of it's mm-hmm. not, and you've got, you know, things want to warp out of shape and all this kind of stuff. So the question is, how many times can we go through a heat cold cycle before we see fatigue failures, right? So mm-hmm. everybody's no, no, experienced a break in a paperclip, right? You bend it once, it's fine, but you bend it back and forth a hundred times and it, and it fails. And so that's that's the kind of fatigue failure that we're worried about. And and we can see that fatigue just from thermal cycling. So every day we heat it up, and then the sun sets and we cool it back down. That puts one cycle of, of thermal fatigue on the device. So how, you know, what's the magnitude of kind of the stress and the number of cycles that we can put that material through before, before it suffers a fatigue failure? Then, so after the kind of mechanical properties and the fatigue properties, we start to look at the optical properties um, because we are using optical energy as a heat source. Um, ideally, we have something that's highly absorbing within the wavelength band of sunlight. So roughly, you know, the 400 nanometers out to about, you know, 2,500 or 3,000 nanometers, kind of that yeah, visible and, and near infrared band where all the sunlight is. Um, we want to be able to absorb all of that energy. So we want a, an absorptivity, which is very, very high. And then if possible, and this was usually the first one that we have to strike off the list when, we, when we're, you know, eliminating options. But in a perfect world, we would also have a low emissivity in longer wavelengths. So mm-hmm. as, as materials get hot, they, they do what's called black body radiation, right? They start to emit infrared. Um, if you ever looked in a thermal camera, you, you kind of see that it's, it's this infrared light that's giving off, um, you know, a signature that's, that's related to the temperature of, of the object. At these high temperatures, that's actually one of the main efficiency losses in that system. So the, the higher the temperature that this, this radiation actually is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. So it gets really, really bad as you go to higher temperatures. So what we would like to do is find a material that has a very low emissivity. So it's not radiating away as much energy because that improves the efficiency. We can produce the same amount of power with, with fewer heliostats that way. In practice, that one tends to be hard to achieve. It's very doable at modest temperatures. There are, there are coatings we can put up to maybe around you know 400 to 500 degrees C. Um, there do exist these kind of highly engineered coatings that have that property of high high absorption in, in the sunlight spectrum and low emissivity and, and longer wavelengths. Um, but those coatings can't withstand the sort of seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand degree temperatures that I'm often pursuing here at Heliogen. So we we usually give that one up. Uh, that was a fantastic explanation. I think it gives us, us a lot insight into how material science plays a role. And so maybe moving forward in the next generation of your technology, what do you think the most promising emerging application of concentrated solar technology is? And how do you think it will transform the energy landscape in, say, the next 10 years? Yeah, I I really think about the kind of near to medium term and then the medium to long term and and kind of separate those in in my mind. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the near term to medium term applications, really what, what we're you know, focused on at Heliogen is this industrial decarbonization. Over the last, call it 20 years or so, there's been a huge amount of effort that's gone into putting renewable electricity on the grid, right? So we've, we've started to make a good dent on that globally, but that hasn't necessarily helped these large industrial customers like I was referring to before, you know, the mining industry and, and you know, big heavy duty factories, steel mills, that kind of stuff. These facilities often use not just electricity, but also thermal energy directly. And they're often a large enough consumer of energy that they actually make their own power. A lot of these places have like a gas turbine or a combined heat and power system that they actually run 
their own small power plants. So they're not necessarily getting all that energy from the grid. And therefore, putting renewable energy on the grid doesn't necessarily reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Mm-hmm. And it's a big problem. Um, you know, globally, about a fifth of all the world's energy consumption is used to provide just heat to industrial processes, not even for their electricity, but just the heat. So it's a it's a big part of the the problem that we need to tackle. So near term, that's really what Heliogen is most focused on, providing heat directly. You know, often it's just process steam, right? Replace the steam boiler that's burning natural gas. Let's give them a solar steam boiler. Um, but then also the electricity for these types of industrial facilities. When I think of a little further out, you know, kind of the five to 10 year horizon, what I'm personally most excited about and a lot of the R&D efforts that that I lead here at Heliogen with a pretty impressive team of researchers that, that work closely with me are really about the higher temperature applications often in material processing. So things like producing quick lime from calcium carbonate. Um, so this is a process that's used in a number of different industries uh, to make cement. That's one of the steps in cement manufacturing. Uh, it's used to make glass. It's used to make steel. Um, it's used in water treatment facilities. There are all these uses of, of quick lime, which is calcium oxide. And to produce quick lime, you start with limestone or calcium carbonate. You heat it up to temperatures somewhere in the order of 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius, so very high temperatures. At that temperature, a chemical reaction occurs to, to decompose that, that uh, calcium carbonate into quicklime. And it's an interesting challenge because those temperatures are high enough. It's, it's pretty difficult to do in other ways other than with a flame, right? The, so the standard way you do this is you, you burn natural gas or some other fuel and, and you heat it up. It's very challenging to power a process like that with renewable electricity. Electric heaters don't like to operate at temperatures like that. So it's a challenging thing to do, but it's also a massive energy sink. Um, You know, globally, the cement industry is responsible alone for about 7% of greenhouse gas emissions. So just one product, think about that. Just one product that we use everywhere. I'm surrounded by it. You're probably surrounded by it as well. It's under us right now, literally, right? 7% of the world's uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from cement. So I'm really excited to find ways to help that problem, both because it's a big problem in terms of the magnitude and, and and the CO2 emissions, but also because it's it's an area where I see technology like what we have at Heliogen and, and with concentrating solar thermal power has a real sweet spot in, in our ability to deliver that kind of energy. It's awesome. I'm, I'm excited to track Heliogen's progress and, <laughs> and continue to see your accomplishments, but taking it a step back and looking at it from the a bird's eye view, um, this world what we live in still is very dependent on fossil fuels and you know there's still very much a need for them that comes with some negative impacts on on, on the climate. So can you comment on what is needed to transition from fossil fuels to solar power or more renewable forms of energy um, in the future? And you know that doesn't just have to be material innovations, but also talking about, you know, a need for for more policy regulations or um, public support, things like that. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a big challenge, right? And big challenges tend to require very multifaceted solutions. So you're exactly right. It's not just a technology solution. It's not just policy. It's it's all of these things together. And I try to keep a holistic view on this because I, I think it helps me do my job well and plan for the future if I'm trying to look at this problem from from all these different angles. So. You know, individuals can make a difference, um, but individuals cannot solve this problem single-handedly. Same thing goes for businesses, same thing for governments. It's got to be all of these different parts of society that are really working together. I do think policy can help. Policy can make a big difference, in my opinion. Um, If we've seen just some of the changes here in the United States since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed last summer, it included a number of provisions that are very favorable for the adoption of renewable energy and these sort of industrial decarbonization efforts. And it's relatively new, right? In, in terms of the, the grand uh, scale of the challenge here, it's it's only maybe eight months old, but we can already see that there's some momentum building. Um, and so, you know, and that's through a combination of things. And it, it really v- ranges from funding opportunities for early stage research and development. So talking about more of the science and the technology that's going to help solve these problems in the long run, there's funding opportunities becoming available to to help with that. Um, But also all the way through to the kind of deployment of more mature technologies, there's tax credits and 
you know, demonstration level funding where, you know, okay, now it's not a million dollar R and D project. It's, it's a hundred million dollar pilot of a more mature technology. And that kind of funding has become available as well, as well as things like production incentives for green hydrogen. Um, so trying to adopt green hydrogen as an alternative and, and renewable fuel for a lot of like transportation and some other applications. So you look at all of that together and, you know, I'm relatively optimistic that over time, as we see the kind of full impact of of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's it's going to be very helpful. But then I think that's also, you know, we want to couple that with the day to day decisions that individuals can make. Right. We, we, we all make decisions all the time about what transportation option we choose to get to and from work or to and from the store and what products we do or don't purchase from which companies, um, you know, who we support in, who who we invest our retirement account in, you know, all of those things. We sort of I, I think of them as micro votes. You know, I, I vote with my wallet. I vote with my, you know, my opinions. It's not just about election time. It's what do I do day to day to try to point things in a direction that I support. And so you know, I'm I'm not deluded enough to think that I'm going to single handedly tilt the whole scale, um, but I do think that we all have the ability to make small impacts on a day to day basis, and, and we should try to do that. And then, of course, you know, given what I do for a living, it's not a surprise that I think technology solutions are also going to be extremely important. Um, so I've mentioned a lot of what Heliogen is working on, but I I also you know one of the things I love about this this job and this field that I'm in is I, I get to stay aware of what's happening at lots of other companies as well. And, you know, university labs and, and national laboratories that are doing just amazing work in, in sort of all different areas of clean tech, um, not just solar, but so, sort of every energy uh, source you can imagine, every material, every product, every manufacturing process. Um, there's smart people all over the world that are that are working on those things and trying to make them more efficient and less dependent on fossil fuels. So, um, you know, that's part of why I really encourage young people to pursue a career in clean tech. Um, you know, I think that it is going to take continued innovation, continued advancement uh, to to finally get where we need to be in, say, the next, you know, 20 or 30 years. So moving forward with this technology, how can the need for rapid innovation and deployment, like you're saying now, we want to revolutionize how we do make big industry also be balanced with uh, the socioeconomic disparities like in poor regions where they don't have access to reliable energy. How can these changes be measured? And then also how can your technology maybe be beneficial to these up and coming uh, economies? Yeah, you know, that's that's a really great question. And one of the things that I'm that makes me proud to work at Heliogen is that this is the kind of thing we we think about and talk about pretty often. Um, it's not a, a an afterthought for us. You know, we we really do try to engage the local communities um, near the projects where we're building. We want to we want to hear their feedback, understand any concerns that they have, and make sure that um, you know they're benefiting from the project, not just you know some corporation profiting on a, on a continent away. So it it is an important thing, and and I think as you know, solving renewable energy. It alone isn't going to help if we don't sort of bring all parts of society along for that ride. One example of, of a way I think this can be done well is, you know, coming back to the Inflation Reduction Act that I mentioned, which provides a lot of funding for these types of projects. I think it's an example of trying to do this the right way as well. So it's not just sort of, you know, a, a free for all, here's a bunch of money, go go do what you're going to do. They've actually included what they call the Justice 40 initiative, um, which basically is it's a goal, and and I'm I'm not a policy expert, so I'm probably going to get some detail wrong in this. But the idea with Justice 40 is that 40% of the overall benefits of these federal funding programs need to flow to disadvantaged communities. Okay, so at least 40% of of however they define the benefits, that's the jobs, the money, the you know the 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 reduction in pollution. These these benefits need to go to communities that have been typically you know underserved one way or another. They they suffer from high unemployment, high poverty rates high levels of pollution in the water or the air or both, all those things together. And, and so they've actually provided a lot of guidance and, and there's there's even like GIS systems, like maps that you can go to online to kind of zoom in on, okay, we've we've got a customer that wants to do a project in this location. Yeah, that's, that, that's a community that needs this kind of project, needs this kind of help, needs the jobs that we would bring, the construction jobs, the operations and maintenance jobs over the life of the project. Um, so I, I think that's one example of really trying to do this the right way. Interestingly, you know, more and more of the companies that come to us as potential customers are also talking about similar things. And it's it's one of the 
one of the signs I've seen in, in progress in the renewable energy industry over the the you know 15 or so years that I've been involved. When I first got involved in renewables, nobody talked about reduction of greenhouse gases actually, and nobody talked about kind of you know environmental justice and socioeconomic factors. What they wanted to know was, can I check the box that I'm providing the mandated amount of renewable energy because I have to comply with some regulation, or can you save me money? And that was it. Those were the only two things that anybody cared about back in, you know, this is a, going back to 2007, 2008 kind of time frame. Now, when companies come to us, they tend to include, you know, in the conversation, things like my shareholders want me to decarbonize. We're sensitive to the land that we're building this on. We want to make sure that we're doing this the right way. We're doing all the environmental impact studies that we need to do. We're involving the community early. We're getting input from all the stakeholders. So the, the conversations are, are very different today than they were. So, you know, again, I'm, I tend to be an optimistic person. I've probably said that a few times, but these things make me optimistic that as we go forward, we're going to be able to, you know, we collectively as society are going to be able to do this the right way. Uh, and we're not going to be, you know, leaving people behind. For sure. It's cool to see that even from like the stakeholder perspective, you're you're looking at the entire life cycle of the technology that you're creating um, and and the environmental impact it'll be making. Um, but just to kind of wrap up this conversation, I know we've discussed the challenges and the you know very promising upcoming developments in uh, solar technology. So for the next generation of students and early career professionals, how can, you know, let's say college students or a recent graduate position themselves to be ready to tackle the challenges um, in this space and, and be at the forefront of these advances? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I always get excited when I see students pursuing, you know, their education and their career in, in STEM fields. I, I I'm really passionate about, about science and about engineering, about technology. And so, it, you know, I, that always makes me feel good, but, but what I really love is when they then take that STEM education and apply it to improving the environment. That's like, now that's my dream come true. So I, you know, I, Anywhere and everywhere I can, I, I do try to encourage students to to pursue those as a field. In terms of how to go about it, my advice is to start by finding the field that you're most passionate about, whether that is material science or if it's, you know, even if it's outside of STEM, it's law and policy or 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 business that that sort of thing. But you know, engineering, science, early stage commercialization, manufacturing, any of those things, because you know what I say is that sustainability is such a huge challenge. It's going to take all of that to make it happen. Um, so STEM is a super important part of it, but it's not the only part. And even within STEM, there's a whole rainbow of different specialties and fields. So my advice is figure out what you're most passionate about in terms of what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis, what kinds of technologies you get excited, and then look for ways to apply that specialty to a career in sustainability. Go talk to people, go to conferences, do a lot of reading, you know, find people like me who are willing to pick up the phone and, and give you advice and, and find, okay, what's the right kind of business or the right kind of laboratory to work in? Or do I belong in a university? But one way or another, find how to, how to take that passion you have and, and apply it to sustainability. You know, as an example, so to, if you think about what it takes to, to make Heliogen successful, a technology like ours, we've got kind of this full life cycle of things happening, right? We've got you know, a team of scientists and researchers who are developing proof of concept and kind of basic technologies, the the materials and processes necessary to just do the fundamental work that needs to be done. Then it kind of goes to product engineers who say, okay, we understand the basics of the technology now, but we have to turn it into a product that we can actually manufacture, we can sell, it can operate reliably day in and day out. Um, and it's all got to be cost effective, Okay. And then, you know, we get involved with more deployment. So project developers, solutions engineers, commercial managers, project managers. These are the people who try to take those products and figure out how to turn it into a project, right? So where are we going to build a thing? Who's the customer so we're supplying the energy to? What do we need to, you know, what are all the kind of logistics of making that, that happen? The economics of making that happen. And then when we kind of say, okay, it's time to go, now it's the execution side. So project engineers, supply chain and procurement teams, project schedulers, construction managers, they all work together to actually go deploy that thing. And then it goes to operations and maintenance. So now we need technicians and, and operators and folks to actually maintain and operate that, that plant for the 20 to 30 years that it's going to, that it's going to live and be providing energy to the customer. So 
you think about the the just vast array of of skill sets and specialties necessary to make all of that happen, you know, I think that absolutely anybody, no matter what you're interested and excited about, you can find a way to use your superpowers to help in a, in a career in sustainability. I love that. I love that. So where can our listeners go to learn more about yourself as well as Heliogen and uh, the next kind of innovations that you're working on? Sure. So heliogen.com is always a good place to start. Um, we actually just recently launched a new website and I think it's awesome. So go go check it out and you can learn a lot about what we're doing there. You want to learn about me? I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, not too hard to find Steve Shell. Um, so, you know, hit me up there, send me messages. I, I do try to respond to people that reach out, especially students. Um, you know, I'm on the phone with students occasionally who are doing, you know, a master's program or a PhD program related to, to concentrating solar power. So I you know, I, I do try to make myself available, particularly for students, because, you know, I, I do want to encourage as much as I can for people to to follow the, this kind of career path. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for joining us today. This was a wonderful conversation, and I'm excited to see what Heliogen accomplishes next. Great. Yeah, it was uh, really a pleasure talking with you both. So I, I appreciate the opportunity. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.